Hey there, soccer freaks. This is ATL on Fire, the podcast where we talk all things Atlanta United Football Club. So sit back, buckle up, enjoy. All right, welcome back to ATL on Fire. Hope everybody's doing well. Uh, it's been several months since we've done a podcast, and uh, here again with uh, Dave Katz, my co-host. How are you doing tonight, Dave? Great. How are you, Mikey Dobbs? I am hanging in there, uh, enjoying some of the Atlanta weather we're having. The last couple of weeks have been pretty stellar. Uh, just got off a of vacation last week and was down in Folly Beach, South Carolina, and uh, yeah, all is good. Great weather and uh, no pollen. Yeah, I know Pollen and uh, Atlanta United Soccer is uh, back in gear. I'm super excited about that. Um, yes. You know, as, as always, there's a new chapter ahead. Uh, on the last podcast, we talked about Heinze, the new coach uh, in charge. And, and obviously, I think it was a great pick for the culture of the club and, you know, a young coach. Um, but, you know, with a, a limited track record, has a good, good one in general. And, um, yeah, seems like a no nonsense type of type type of coach. Yeah, it's a reputation really for uh, high intensity, um, not just as a player, but uh, as a coach, demanding all the time. You know, high intensity training from from the players. I think, it, as I mentioned, maybe on the last podcast, it was uh, Alex Ferguson who said that. <laughs> uh, Heinz would, you know, knock over your grandmother if he needed to, to win a soccer game. Yeah. I, I love, I love the attitude. And uh, yeah. So, you know, he's, he's now um, a little bit of a track record from the preseason games and uh, two CCL games in CONCACAF champions league. So we've got to see a little bit of his coaching style and action, even, even if lim- limited, and, um, you know, in, in unique situations, having to fly down to Costa Rica for the first, uh, the first leg. And then uh, here in Atlanta last night for part two, and we've, we've made it through. Um, well, it's interesting. You got to actually see four different kinds of formations, right? You could talk about first half of the first leg, second half of the second leg after the red card, first half of the second leg. And then second half, once they change the formation. So we can talk about four different styles of Heinze. So I would love to get into that. Um, you're really good at obviously breaking down some of the details on, on what you saw in these games and, and changes in formations and some of the, some of the little things that, that I probably miss. You know, at a macro level, though, um, as I look back at the two games, and I know it sounds like you and I have very differing opinions, and a lot of the people on, on Twitter uh, are, aren't happy with, with my point of view either. I'm, I'm pretty critical of uh, the performance in general. And, you know, it, it first comes from the macro level of, you know, Atlanta United is setting the bar high for an MLS team, which is supposed to be a growing league that's extremely competitive. The same way the bar for the U.S. men's national team right now um, is trying to reach a, a new level, at least at the senior level. We know that the uh, the, the Olympic squad did not uh, get the job done uh, again. And for the same reasons, I would crack on Atlanta United here. I love Costa Rica. Costa Rica is probably one of my favorite countries uh, I've spent the most time in. Ticos are fabulous people, but I know the country quite well. We're talking about a very small Central American country. Two thirds of it is protected rainforest uh, in wonderful uh, rainforest in, in places to go. The only city that really has any soccer is San Jose. And I don't know what the population is, but that's all the teams that are in the CCL from, uh, you know, who's playing the Philadelphia union tonight. uh, And the team we played uh, a la Valencia. And, you know, not only that, the game last night, a la Valencia came in with seven starters missing. And, you know, we're talking about you know, the difference of a league that, you know, Atlanta United, I think roughly our, our revenue on players is 65 million. I think I saw something like that um, online somewhere. And so, you know, we're paying our players quite a bit more than the talent, I would assume, you know, these Costa Rican teams are. So right there, to me, there's an expectation that we should be doing a lot better than these teams. So 
you know, it, I realized this team went on a run before they played us uh, in the first leg. They hadn't lost a game in 25 games. Sounds like they were in good form. So I'll give them that. It doesn't matter. I think, you know, when you look at some of the talent that we have on the Atlanta United side, the coaching, the investment, I think we need to do a lot better. You know, that's, it, you know, that's just the bottom line. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start before I argue with you with one slight digression, which is who allowed Jason Christ to coach our Olympic team? Okay, I know there was a yeah. lot of talk about in relationship to Atlanta United and other clubs not releasing players like Miles Robinson and Bello, who could have played on that Olympic team. But um, for the, those out there in the podcast, uh, we once again failed to qualify for the Olympics. Three times, um, three times in a row. Uh, I believe that's correct, but yep. at least, at least the last two. But um, the uh, Jason Christ, you know, is an MLS, an old MLS coach. Actually, you know, before that he was at Duke. But um, the he had some success initially um, with Salt Lake City, I believe. And, uh, you know, so maybe that's a great credential initially, but he was subsequently coached twice for two other MLS teams. He was coach of the Red Bulls for a long time. And then he yeah. was coach of, um, I guess, Orlando and just bombed at both places. So who hires that person with that track record to uh, coach the Olympic team for that matter? And I, I'll just, you know, I'll just keep going on my tangent. Who hires Stephen Glass to coach Aberdeen after his performance with Atlanta United last year? Yeah. Yeah, some of it, to, or Frank DeBoer to uh, Holland, who's, you know, regretting that, it seems, already. Um, Frank DeBoer, you know, I mean, uh, you know, we won't rehash that, but he has some uh, great track record initially with Ajax, and even his record with us is – yeah is is more than respectable so you know yeah no i i i agree so um but you know back to atlanta united versus a costa rican side uh i don't know like at, at that level of thinking in terms of what this club should be doing in its fourth year um with you know obviously a young squad but a proven young squad from some of the signings that they had um i feel like the performances should have been particularly the last one right so goose came i actually thought they played pretty decent up until goose uh came out and got the red card and obviously the game gets flipped on its head and you know good good on them getting the getting the one point a man down away um so that that game wasn't pretty and they did what they had to do in that even though it wasn't pleasing on the eye that whole, that whole game but i was really disappointed in the second leg i get it in terms of being one up in aggregate and playing in a way that just um, doesn't necessarily need to be overly offensive, but I just did not see um, a lot of creativity up front. And I did see enough um, attacking chances that could have put that one-to-one and going, go into penalty shootout outs at any moment, all the way up to the 90th minute. I'm kind of surprised, you know, I mean, if we're just talking about the second leg, um, I'm kind of surprised at how, down you are and, and really a lot of the fan base has been about that leg. I thought actually that Atlanta United played quite well in that second leg. I mean, yes, we lacked some um, cohesiveness and clearly some finishing in the final third. Um, you know, we slammed the crossbar. Uh, the, the goalkeeper made a phenomenal save on Marcelino. But, you know, if you look at um, the attacking movement, um, and actually, to be honest with you, even if you look at the defensive organization, I thought both were excellent. Um, and, and yes, uh, you know, maybe the outcome wasn't quite as dominant as you might expect if the defending and the movement is really excellent, like I thought it was. But I, I, I see I attribute that a little bit to you know, there were a few clearly sloppy early balls kind of things, but the movement was terrific and the organization was terrific. And if you get that right, it's just a matter of time before it clicks. Um, I actually thought that Atlanta United, despite the scoreline, were actually quite excellent in the second leg. 
I, it just, it, it lacked that consistency. And so I, I am an optimist in usually, um, and, and um, I, you know, obviously I'm a fan of Atlanta United, so I, I would love to be proven wrong. I just did not see a lot of gelling that I would have even liked to have seen in, in the first couple of games in terms of Moreno, particularly who I was really high on from, from seeing in the, in the few games we saw last year of him. I thought he had a kind of average game. Of course, he had some good moments and shots, a couple he, he put way over the crossbar, um, but a few that were very dangerous and in, in, in on, on net. Um, let, let me start from the back, though, because I, I think we, I'm optimistic to see the young keeper, uh, Rios, uh, who's I think the under 23 Argentinian goalkeeper, at least be an option. It sounds like he's playing for the twos. And, um, but it's nice to see that we've got depth there. It, it was kind of fun to see a different style of goalkeeper come out that, you know, you wouldn't see Brad Guzan kind of walk way outside of the 18 like that typically and, and kind of get involved a little further up the field. So I, it was just kind of refreshing to see that to some degree. And yep. uh, the, the kid was brash. He made a critical save at that, you know, with his leg on that one, uh, one ball that uh, came across that you know, I think was probably the key moment in the game, to be honest. Key moment in the game. And um, so I, I was high on him uh, in, in both legs. Um, so that's a plus. Uh, George Bello, um, I have very mixed emotions on uh, at this point. Clearly in that second leg, the first half uh, was not a good one for him. Uh, I would say he very much turned it around in the second half. Um, but there was a lot of dangerous over-the-top balls that, um, you know, he uh, he was really put under a lot of pressure. And, you know, the, the one that could have been a penalty or just on the edge, I think it was in the penalty box personally. I think that was a penalty. Um, personally, I think it was a foul outside the box. Okay. Well, I, it was a foul. I, I didn't go back and, and instant replay it, but it was definitely a foul in my opinion. Yep. And so we got, we got lucky there. Uh, and, and, you know, I think uh, there was a couple moments where his side was definitely under a pressure that there were some balls that came across there that could have been goals. And so regardless of your point around the formation, I, I just wasn't feeling overly comfortable with being able to take on, uh, a very young Costa Rican side, again, a team that was missing seven of their starters, and they're still putting that type of pressure on us. They were missing all of their two of two of their three attackers. So, imagine if they actually had their full squad. Yeah, um, I guess maybe I'm not. I, I feel like the, in the Costa Rican league, you're not going to get so many superstar players that you know, their quality of the first five or whatever is not going to be so different than the quality of 11 through 16. So I, I doubt. Uh, that I think that's a cop out. I mean, come on, these guys are in there. They have a pecking order. I think, I think the advantage to them was these younger players really felt like this was an opportunity for them. So they were probably playing yeah, they had nothing to lose and nothing to lose. And they're, you know, and that's how, and everything to gain. So I know how that is in terms of coming up against these, these kids that just saw this as an opportunity. And I think they stepped up and perform, which, you know, good, good on them. Um, but again, I'm looking at it from our perspective and saying, you gotta, you know, you know, put the hammer down. Yeah. I mean, I think at the end, you know, in terms of outcome, sure. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't really ascribe as much to the fact that, that, you know, coast, the Costa Rican side had such a terrible team here. Um, you know, I think that combined with us being, you know, basically first game versus their midseason, you know, but uh, so that to me doesn't bother me that much in terms of the outcome. What to me is much more important is to see the actual, the way the team sets up and, and the players. So, so, you know, if you want to go player for player, right, you know, so Bello, I think um, there's some concerns, right? So if you look on the, on the negative side, um, I think sometimes tactically he's a little bit naive in reading the game. Um, on the plus side, um, he has tremendous speed and can make up for a lot of mistakes. Um, so I'm not sold on Bello defensively. I, you know, if we go back to last year, I really yeah. rode him hard. Uh, and I, I think, um, you know, he's certainly by no means the finished article at left back, but 
But yeah, you, you've got to hand it to him. He kept his head up and really turned it around and fin- finished the game tremendously strong defensively and um, got back and shielded a lot of uh, a lot of balls protected out of bounds and you know with with tired legs. So I'll give him that for sure. I also think that um, walks playing you know, behind him, so to speak, or next to him. Um, <clears throat> Wax is not a good player. So do you know what his uh, passing percentage was evidently in that game? No. He had 81 passes. How many of them do you think were complete? Based on what you're saying, I'm going to say 79. <laughs> it was 81 evidently. Okay. Um, and so that, that, that's irrelevant though. I mean, I know it is, but it's an interesting set. It's, it's a club record. Anyway, I'm just giving him props at all. His passes are literally just to the next guy who's got the ball. Yeah. Right. Um, and defensively, he's tactically very naive. Um, you know, actually, if you go back to the key moment of the game, um, the one where the goalkeeper made the, the, the yeah. kick save, um, you know, he, it's funny. He was in the middle of the field uh, Miles Robinson was all pushed out wide, marking on the outside, and he was left alone with that guy in the center. He was at sixes and sevens reading that play, and it was a beautiful ball. Don't get me yeah, wrong, yeah, yeah, absolutely beautiful ball. But if Miles Robinson was in that play, he wins that ball. It walks, and he didn't get that ball, and that's what created the goal scoring chance. So, you know, I think that the, the you know. Walks is just a placeholder, right? Obviously, Alan Franco is going to walk right into this team and he's going to take that spot. So the question is, you know, how much better is Alan Franco? From everything that we have heard, his pedigree, I mean, he's capped once for Argentina. He starts at 23 for Independiente. Um, You know, I've watched some of the videos. They look very, very good. Yeah. you know, the expectation is that that is a serious upgrade from that. Yeah. And then we, we have an upgrade next to him as well with Sosa, correct? Um, he was well, another, I was going to say, let's keep going along the back line. You know, yeah. Miles Robinson, um, I think, steps right back into where what he did last year. He was terrific um, in both legs. Um, his one-on-one defending is outstanding. I think he's only going to get better if he has someone who's reading the game next to him, unlike Walks. Um, who is really reacts to the game. I mean, he does not really read the game well. Um, yeah, I wanted then, to be a little higher on um, Miles. There was a couple moments where even on man-on-man, I think in, in the last game, and I, I can't rec- recall, but I remember making a mental note where there were a couple little breakdowns where – He kind of got beat once along the end line. Yeah. Um, but I thought altogether, you know, almost everything that was his way, he won the ball. But one thing that, that you'll notice tactically, um, unlike the dreadful, you know, passive defending that we had under the DeBoer or Glass kind of, and maybe honestly to even be a little bit critical of Tata, if that was the one thing I would say is critical of Tata, is that defenders were not quite up the field challenging people and making it difficult. Yeah. You watch the game, those defenders are asked to go win the ball. And Miles Robinson is very capable of going and winning the ball. And what happens is that he is now, instead of winning, you know, under DeBoer and Glass, he was winning tackles, miraculous tackles, just outside our penalty area, in our penalty area, if you noticed in both legs of this, of this, um, of the champions league, he was winning the ball at midfield. Yeah. That is a total night and day change. Do you think, and I think, you know, this is the one thing I would give the Costa Rican coach credit for, because you knew their moments were going to be limited in that game to, to have a shot. But what they did is they were playing very effective long balls over the top. And, you know, with that philosophy, as we go into the MLS season, do you think that that's going to be, a vulnerability with that that style and all, it also it pressing up a little bit more from from your your backs and also what seems to be much more of a more of a one-on-one type of matchup system that Heinze seems to be employing where you, you know you're you're definitely responsible uh for for your man and and if you get beat it's going to it's going to be glaring well, well, we'll have yet to see whether or not, you know, how the, the players are playing behind those guys and how much they're, they're, they're you know, 
working together as pairs. But, um, you know, even under Tata, right, you know, you cannot win the ball at any level as a press or even if it's not a press, you can't win the ball in the other team's half unless your defenders are up the field challenging people. And actually Tata, you know, the one thing he had is he had the defenders up the field. He was asking them to try to win the ball. And if you recall the cup, there were a couple of epic, you know, horrible blunders where people got, you know, right through on these sort of breakaways. Right. Um, And that happens. Right. Um, You know, in an ideal world, you have defenders that are really up the field challenging. You're winning the ball all the time in their half, and that just allows you to score goal after goal after goal like they did under Tata. And you can accept the occasional moment where you get beat with something. And you hope that your central backs in particular have enough strength and pace that you know you can't just you you can't just get beat by just somebody kicking the ball long over the top, you know aimlessly you have to be beat by something good um and at our worst under tata when our back two wasn't quite perfectly set you know we gave up a few goals where it was just sort of kicked long over the back but um you know at our best when carmona or remedy was sitting in front of them um you know parkhurst when he was playing the best um you know, and Gonzalo, Gonzalo Perez um, was at his best, you know, then we looked solid and we were up the field and that allowed, you know, goal after goal after goal with Al, Al picking somebody's pocket um, or us win, winning the ball on a turnover and, and, you know, scoring after two or three passes or two passes or one pass. Yeah. So, um, you know, that is clearly what Heinze, you're going to see from Heinze, which is an aggressive style um and is way better if you talk you know it's funny when the casual fan wants to see attacking soccer if you talk to steven glass for example and you ask him oh yeah we're going to play attacking soccer and the the thing that he said was how we're going to play attacking soccer we're sending our outside backs forward we're allowing our midfielders to go we're giving them freedom to play whatever to be honest with you, in the modern game, if you want to play attacking soccer, it's about your center backs winning the ball at midfield. That's what gives you a lot of goal scoring chances. It has nothing to do with giving those guys the freedom because unless you can win the ball in the middle of the field, you just don't get the chances. Yeah. So let's keep going around the horn from the back. Who, who Who's next on the, the, the defensive side you want to talk about? Um, so, you know, obviously um, – at right back, um, you have um, oh my god, his name just went right out of my head. Um, you got the wing back, Lennon. Who am I? Lennon, kind of... Brooks Lennon. Um, yeah, so so Brooks Lennon. You know, there's a question about whether or not um, Brooks Lennon is the guy, or whether it's going to be Ronald Hernandez, who is the player, the Venezuelan right back, who we signed from. Uh, or loaned, I guess, from Aberdeen. Mm. Um, we haven't, I haven't heard about why he's not necessarily playing or whether, because my impression was that that was sort of his, you know, spot to lose, but um, we'll see. So I have no idea whether Brooks Lennon is sitting there as a placeholder or whether Brooks Lennon has won the spot. Um, I don't know. Um, I think Brooks Lennon is a terrific player. Certainly offensively, he can deliver a beautiful cross. He has a tremendous work rate getting up and down. He's pretty good one-on-one defending. Um, he's not tactically naive. You know, um, I thought actually he, he played pretty well. Yeah, I don't have a lot of negatives with Brooks Lennon, but I also don't have like a lot of glowing stuff for Lennon either. I mean, I think he's, he's um, you know, he's somebody good. Like he's, his work rate is tremendous. So, you know, that's one thing that I, I like from him a lot. And so I'll never really complain if he goes in and plays like he does, because uh, I, I think he definitely is not a liability uh, most of the time. And One of the things that you saw, which I have never seen from Atlanta United before is that both Bello and Brooks Lennon actually went forward inside of the outside midfielder. There were times <laughs> where they made the run sort of underneath that, you know, um, yeah. And even though they did, they didn't really, 
necessarily get put through. There was one where Brooks Lennon was pretty wide open, made an absolutely terrific run, and they, they missed it. But um, or maybe they tried to make the ball and it and didn't succeed. But um, what's underappreciated is that opens up all of the time and space um, for Marcelino on one side, um, for um, Dam on the other side, and and actually. You know, last year at our worst, um, you had Barco. Every time he had the ball, there was just players draped all over him. And you didn't see that because of the that running. Um, they didn't allow players to drape all over him, and it gave him a lot more space to operate. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. I definitely saw a different look from the wing backs in terms of not just being pinned to the outside line. Um, well, now, that, now that you mention that- it. There were two things that were different. One was that um, they didn't just go, you know, drives me crazy. They just mindlessly run up to yeah. midfield. They weren't def- definitely not doing that. Yeah, it seemed like there was effective runs, particularly from, you know, Dam when he w- was in. Um, but again, uh, to your point, it was a lot more like cutting inside uh, type of stuff, which I love. Like when you're out outside cutting in at angles is so damaging to a, a defense in terms of, not really knowing what to expect is the net next move when you make those diagonal runs from a really wide position. So I always love seeing that. We were so predictable under DeBoer. I mean, so predictable um, to the point where, you know, you literally could put a foosball table on our team and said, all right, this is the run that this guy makes. And he goes up and down on this track and you know, that's it. Or maybe not foosball because it wasn't just, Turning, yeah. but, you know, what remember that old hockey game that you oh, used to yeah, play? Yeah, yeah. You, you, you're on a line. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's got the big dome, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That, that was that was DeBoer soccer. You are allowed to run your track. Yep. You do not deviate from your track. So um, the creativity about the movement was was tremendously different, and it's going to take a little bit of time. But what was remarkable is you had that running, you had that creativity, and yet when we lost the ball. Right. Unlike, you know, DeBoer, where we didn't have the creativity and when we lost the ball, we sometimes had players who were wide open. This time we had much more creative running. And still, when we lost the ball, it was all marked up. Right. Which is an unbelievable improvement. And you'll see that will make a huge difference long term. Um, You know, we made it difficult for the most part. They were only a, a handful of times, maybe less, where I saw somebody be able to outlet the ball and there was a player who really was alone in space. For the vast majority of the time, we had a guy draped all over that first pass. And it goes down to a lot, the guy who is just, I mean, to say a vast improvement is the understatement of the century is Sosa. Um, yeah. Sosa... Um, he's got a swag, he's got a swagger. I love, I love that. The interesting thing is that he doesn't have any remarkable talents, right? He doesn't yeah. seem that fast. He's got beautiful he hair. I think <laughs> he doesn't <seem laughs> super skillful. His passing is good, but you know, it's not like he's so creative or whatever, but that guy understands the game. Yeah. He knows. You can tell to, to your point, someone who's looking at space and reading the game at a young, young age, you can see that guy's got it. Um, yeah, and he's taking up spaces. You know, I mean, obviously, you know, in the first half of the first leg, he was asked to do this role. They clearly played with, you know, ironically, in the first leg, in the first half, was probably what most people would consider our most offensive output. But ironically, that was the most defensive tactically that we had. We had, when we were going forward, he had Sosa going backwards, a la the old Tata, when he had that with Remedy, when we won the uh, MLS Cup, every time we would go forward, right, um, Parkhurst and Gonzalo Perez would spread out and Remedy would go backwards. And Sosa was doing the exact same thing in the first leg. Interestingly, he never did that in the second leg. So that is not a, this is the way we are going to play all the time. It is clearly, that is how we're going to play defensively on the road in certain places where we're being a little more cautious and at home where we expected to try and really roll over them. He was not assigned to that role. Yeah. 
So who's next? Who do we want to dig into? Yeah, well, I was just going to, you know, so Sosa is covering in spaces behind people. He's taking up. He's often on the most dangerous guy when they try to outlet the ball. I mean, he is tactically um, so far cut above. I mean, the only player who comes close to that um, it was the very, very opening season. Carlos Carmona um, was a player who was maybe as smart, but to me, Sosa looks like maybe he's even better. Yeah, I I was definitely high on his play in both games. So um, excited to see how he continues to to improve. And um, you can't underestimate how much that does to a team. If you have center backs in Robinson and Franco who can mostly win battles on their own and they're protected because nobody has a chance to just, you know, have all day to try to pick out a run in behind them, then defense is going to dominate. And when they dominate, I don't mean by necessarily getting shutouts because we're going to be clearly a very aggressive defensive side. And so we're going to give up the goal a la Tata where occasionally the guy gets through, we're going to win some games three to one, maybe, but, um, but what that does is it allows you to continuously win the ball in the other opponent's half, which means that you put the ball on Barco and, and Marcelino and um, Joseph Martinez's feet, you know, extra three, four times a game. And, you know. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm struggling to remember who, who else is in the midfield uh, in front of Sosa. We can... Well, in both legs, he played initially with Abara and uh, Emerson Heinemann. Heinemann, that's right. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I thought Heinemann in the first leg was probably a placeholder, placeholder because Marcelino um, was suspended. People forget. That's right. Yeah, the um, red card. In the craziness that was the pandemic world, we played a second leg. Um, at uh in orlando against club america after the leg was already over because we lost i think three nil at their place yeah. um and we actually won one nothing john uh, stephen glass's only good outcome <laughs> when, when they clearly just didn't care um but regardless in the end of that game um, there was an incident where a guy fouled him pretty badly and he retaliated and kicked back at him and it was sent off appropriately. Yeah. Um, and that's why he couldn't play in the first leg. But what's interesting is like, I, I don't see him as a hothead really though. No, I think doesn't he, like he, he doesn't seem like a hothead at all. He seems like he can put on a smile, but I think in that one, that was a situation where he got wronged and was going to let the world know that he doesn't put up with crap. But yeah. yeah, I think, you know, even with some of the injustices, maybe on some calls against him in the, in the game the other night, he didn't seem to uh, get, get overly emotional about it, which was, was uh, encouraging to see, you know, right. I think you want that, that level of maturity of the, a player like that, that uh, is, is a designated player. He's, he's, he's been there, done that and can, can roll with the punches. So even though I don't think he had the greatest game, uh, for what I'm expecting of him. Cause I think, I just feel like I, I that guy's going to do a lot this year. At least I want him to um, same way I did with PT. Um, I just feel like Moreno is a better fit. I think he's just a cool customer. Yeah. Moreno is a much more run at you kind of guy. PD was a, uh, you know, uh, sort of stand and collect the ball and creative, try to pass. And um, Marcelino is much more in a, um, the mold of Al Marone. Um, and, you know, granted, you know, first game, I'm going to give him a little bit of a pass, you know, fair. Um, but, you know, again, um, every time he had the ball one on one with his guy, the defender, um, he was able to break them down and beat him. Now, three times he absolutely missed, hit the shot and skied it into. Uh, um, nowhereville but but yeah. the, the 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 other the fourth time i mean he should have scored it was just yeah. beautiful play. beautiful and they didn't do a great job with the replay on that but the keeper definitely got a solid hand on that and i think it was going in it was just yeah, gonna, it, was, it was definitely going in the keeper was celebrating big time he was like did you see that yeah did you see that because <laughs> yeah i think that was a backup keeper right so yeah i think he was pretty pumped um so I don't really recall Ibarra that much in the game. Can you help me recollect any sort of significant moments? 
he didn't really show up that much in either of the two games. He was substituted at halftime in the second game, so he only played okay. for the half. But and so did Hyman come in for him, or did Hyman start? I can't recall. No, Hyman started in both games. Yeah. Um, what came in for him is he made the tactical switch. He brought on Jurgen Dam, and then he moved. Um, he moved Barco into the middle and Marcelino switched flanks from right to left. And we went, so it's interesting. So it's, it's pretty clear that um, when Sosa and Ibarra play together, um, we're almost playing with two defensive midfielders. Um, Ibarra actually had a reputation of being a defensive midfielder, which I was surprised because I was surprised that we were buying two defensive midfielders. Yeah. Um, and some people said, oh, no, 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 maybe he's actually really supposed to be an attacking midfielder. Um, from what I could see from the first two legs, he is a little bit more of a defensive-minded midfielder. And when we play them together, we're playing almost two defensive midfielders. So um, I think that just gives you tactical um, – it gives you tactical freedom and, yeah. and a lot of flexibility. Variation. Yeah. Flexibility. Yeah. Um, Cause obviously um, normally I think that, you know, you got to figure our best starting lineup, Barco's a shoe in um, Marcelino Moreno is a shoe in. Yeah. Um, and then the question becomes, do you play with another winger like Jurgen Dam? Or do you play a little bit more tactical um, with a player like Ibarra? Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I think you have to play Jurgen Dom um, as, as much that he does wrong. He does a lot right. And it, he's what I love about him is he's, he's on the front foot. He's putting the team under pressure. And we don't have a lot of other players other than Barco, maybe Moreno, that are putting the defense on their heels once we have it in their half. Um, and Dom consistently does that, even if some of the final crosses, as we saw, are skied over everyone and not really put in great places. He does get them in, in good positions at other times. And, you know, you can see he's putting people on their, on their back foot and, I think that's dangerous. I think that can only progress as the timing gets better o over the year. I would call Jurgen Dom what's called a, a luxury player, which is yeah. if the team is really, really good and there's a lot of movement, he's just going to thrive and be a star. If the team is not good, he's just going to disappear. Um, and I think he's going to thrive in this system because there's enough. Um, yeah, there's enough yeah, with with Bark with Barco and Moreno and hopefully Joseph back in form. Over, I'm a little scared of that, but hopefully Joseph back in form. He will be a luxury luxury player out on the right. He'll be a terrorist out there, just constantly putting. You know, once that ball gets out there, any type of ball that he puts in there to those three should be dangerous. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think I, I'm a big fan of his. I think that the. Um, you know, I think that the people have been on him a little bit for the end product. I think it's a little overhyped. You know, there's a tendency to take a player who's really creative and fast and say, well, there must be something wrong with him. And so then when he misdelivers a final ball, they say, oh, well, look, of course, there's the thing that's wrong with him. Other, Because otherwise, he'd be a superstar. Right? Mm -hmm. if you're that fast and that yeah. creative. And you can deliver a final ball. But, um, you know, the you'd be careful, right? Because, you know, some of those guys, and I think he doesn't necessarily struggle to deliver that final ball. Some guys look so naive in that. And he doesn't at all. He looks like he can pick out a pass. He looks like he can deliver a ball. He actually is not all one foot, which is really good. Um, yeah. You know, be careful. He could become that star. Yeah, no, I, you know, if you look glass half full on that, I, I definitely agree that, um, you know, particularly to your point if he is truly be, you know freed up with the attention on the other players then he could even be way more dangerous um as things go our way um do you want to talk about Heinemann at all or move, move on to the big three i mean Heinemann um i think you know, in this team with everything going could end up being a, you know, a really nice player because he's smart. He does everything pretty well, nothing spectacularly, but you know, he can create, he can defend, 
he can string together passes. Um, he can tactically, you know, do what you want. Um, and when you have that in a, as a glue in amongst all of this other talent, I think it could really work. Yeah. So I think Barco, in my opinion, was definitely the MVP of both both games. If I had to pick, uh, you know, I think he he realizes the pressure on himself for where he probably wants to go in his career and how important this year is. And and so you know, I think he knows the task ahead for him um, based on where I think he wants to go. You know, maybe beyond Atlanta United. And so I think you know his work rate similar to Lennon is probably the highest on the team. Um, you know, particularly the last game, you know, his defense actually was maybe one of the top things he was doing. And I mean, I don't know if you notice how many times he cut back and like snake the ball from people. I mean, I can count at least five really good. Well, it's interesting. Moments. They had him, you know, again, it's an interesting that Heinz are really appreciating on corner kicks and set pieces where, Let's face it, Barco's probably not going to win the most head balls. Yeah. Um, he has Barco sitting in the midfield as sort of a sweeper um, using his pace. And three or four times, um, <clears throat> he did a brilliant job of beating someone to the ball defensively um, to stop a counterattack. Yeah. You know, the other- that's an example of, you know, just to coach already. I mean, Heinz has had just, what, a couple of weeks to work with him. And already yeah. you have players doing things tactically that you – we have never seen under, you know, Stephen Glass or even under De Boer. Yeah. Players doing unusual things, players playing different roles in different moments. Um, yeah, and I think it took, day. It, and it took Bark a little, t- in, in the last game anyway, a little time to warm up. Um, but once he, you know, he, he was attacking, but, you know, didn't get through some people the first 15, 20 minutes, but then finally had some moments where he was taking shots and, and uh, look, looking like he was putting the team on their heels, uh, which was good. One of the things I'm excited about Barco, and this should have happened long ago uh, with PT Martinez taking free kicks. Um, I love the fact that all the opportunities I've seen with Barco on free kicks, and he, he actually scored one in the preseason that was pretty beautiful. He puts them on frame. I, you have no chance of scoring unless they're on frame. I don't care how pretty it is. And if it goes over the bar, make the keeper, make a save. And Barco uh, does that with his free kicks and his penalty kick was an example of that. Was it perfect? No, but you know what? It was on frame and it went in cause it bounced right in front of the keeper keeper, which made it difficult. And it went in the net and we went up one, nothing in the first leg. Um, and, and the even cynical view though about Barco though is, yeah, I agree with you almost completely. The cynical view is in both uh, the previous two seasons, he came flying out of the gate, had really good performances in the first two or got three injured. games, and then got injured. Yeah, and, and even just even necessarily he faded a little bit, you know. And that might just be young, and also the injuries. But um, you know, the question is, can he sustain it at all? Yeah, no, I think that's a hundred percent valid. We'll I want to actually go back to the, the just a moment we were talking about before with Barco um, playing off the corner kicks as a, you know, a defensive midfielder almost. Um, it's such an unusual move. Um, the last time you saw things like that was under Tata, for example. Um, I think it was in New York when we won the critical playoff game under Tata um, on the way to winning the title. And Miles Robinson, who had really was not playing at all, suddenly came in as an extra marking back in that game and tactically just marked somebody out of the game. Uh, I think um, the Hispanic guy, what's his name? But anyway, um, just the use of talents and different things tactically. um, You know, I would say that Heinze in his brief moments – has shown that he is um, 50% tactically better than DeBoer or Stephen Glass ever were. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm still, I'm still going to be a little cautious. We'll see. I, I, I love your energy on that, and I think I, I, would, I would like to agree. But I'm just gonna no, it, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to work. You know, if, if, it, if it 
um, if the tactics don't become brilliant, um, I don't think, you know, you should come back to me and say, look, but Dave, you said that the, the tactics would be brilliant. And no, I haven't said that. What I mean is that there's movement. They are trying things. And unless you have that, you can't possibly succeed. Tata had that and got it right. And eventually it was super successful. Um, we'll see. The jury is out whether or not Heinze can do that. But just the potential of it yeah. um, is way higher. We just set the bar way higher than we were. Yeah, and I think one of the things that Barco is going to need in his court to stay healthy is everyone around him to stay healthy um, so that he's not forced to do too much, which I think he certainly was last year. Um, and, and I think that got to him mentally and probably didn't know how to reserve his, uh, his stamina in a way that prevented him from getting dinged up as much as he did. Um, so Moreno, do you want to jump to Moreno? Because, um, yeah, I, I already touched on it. I think his attitude is right, which is one thing I love. Um, and I hope that continues. And I think, yeah, is as down as I was on what his output was, because I just I think I was overly excited. I, I, I had like this internal bet that that guy's going to be a superstar for the team. I was just waiting for him in this second game to really do something special um, and, and maybe those shots will go in in some of these games coming up. But I, I think, you know, he's able to take people on. I think he's physical. I don't think he cries and whines. He's, you know, he's, he works hard. He's not, not the luxury PT Martinez type of player. He is a, a real teammate and in, in, in there in the mix. He plays on the front foot. Um, and uh, again, doesn't mean that it'll work but um, it has a chance to be very successful. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with the timing, um, particularly is, is the, the front three gel. Um, and, you know, I can only imagine um, what's going through Joseph Martinez head up front, recovering from a major knee surgery, which I know you can um, empathize with quite a bit and, and what goes through your head as particularly a professional athlete in his position, trying to get back to the form that, that he was at prior to the injury, which was really peaking. And, you know, that's where you, a half a step makes all the difference from you being an average forward to the talk of the MLS. And so you can see it in his body language. He is just not there mentally. Uh, I watched a, um, interview on ESPN FC with uh, the, the uh, other uh, uh, El Salvadorian striker, Ali, I guess I think is his name. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was, it was really fascinating to see Joseph Martinez in the interview, really lacking any swagger. You could see almost this internal nervousness of where he was physically and mentally with the injury, likely having, you know, judged himself during the preseason, having judged himself during the 30 minutes he had during the first leg. Um, you can see that he's just not, and you could obviously see it in the, in the game. Uh, he is struggling to uh, figure out how to physically and mentally fit in. Yeah, I agree. And um, sad as it is to say, there is no guarantee that Joseph Martinez will ever be what he was now i yeah. think he will be but um you never know there are players who do acl and never come back to be the same player um and they tend to be the kind of player that he was which is really super quick um yeah so yeah um i agree with you i mean that's a big question mark what i don't agree with is you know in the broadcast alexi lalas who's awful um, you know, he says, look, you know, if Joseph Martinez doesn't score goals, there's no one in this team who's ever scored more than, I think he said, four goals in the top flight. And so, um, you know, where are the goals going to come from? I, uh, you know, I disagree with that completely. Um, mm. Keep in mind that many I don't like Alexi either, but I think he's got a pretty strong point there. Where are the goals going to come from if we don't have Joseph Martinez? It's not the 38-year-old guy chewing gum, is it? 
Um, no, he's not going to be the, the leading goal scorer. That, but, you know, Moreno. By, by the way, who I like more than Adam John, just for the oh, record, yeah. oh, uh, yeah. for sure. But, um, you know, spit out the gum and get serious about the game, even though you're already retired in the MLS. Like, I'm sorry. I just – there's a little – there's small things I, I, I pick up on that I just – Spit out the gum and get in there and score some goals when you know when you have your opportunity. Anyway, go on. Yeah, you're talking about Lissandro uh, Lopez. Yes, right? who I who I actually like other than chewing gum. Well, you know, Lissandro Lopez um, has a tremendous record. I mean, he was yeah, uh, you know, top five goal scorer in um, uh, in Spain. So I know, yeah. You know, um, he just happens to be 38 years old. But. Yeah, I know, which I love. I love old people, but I just want him to have a little bit more of an edge, spit out the gum and start scoring some goals. I think he's going to be – he's a tremendous addition to the team. You love putting him in yeah. in the last 10 minutes when people are tired where he can be this wily veteran, and the guy can score, clearly. Yeah. Um, he scored a lot of goals. Uh, I mean, even – yeah, even from the games I've seen, like – just so much smarter than Adam John in terms of just understanding space and just slight movements that make all the difference. I mean, well, it's, he moves period. Yeah. He moves <laughs> period. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yes, um, certainly, you know, even if, um, you know, we need to give uh, Joseph plenty of time to recover and find his footing and make sure he's not doing something stupid to re-injure his ACL. Um, Make sure that guy gets in there and 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 gets his moments. I'm, I'm sure uh, between the two of them, if Heinze is able to manage the minutes correctly, I think that would be smart. The way they they either start one or the other to just kind of manage the momentum of the game as uh, Martinez hopefully gets back in form. Well, I suspect you'll see Cubo Torres, you know, occasionally. Oh, that's right. I forgot about Cubo. Uh, and yeah. the other thing. Um, there, there's a player that everybody has forgotten about who I don't think you should forget about, which is Rosetto. Mm. Uh, I think Rosetto has talent, and I wouldn't be surprised if we're talking a lot more about Rosetto by the end of this year. Yeah, that's and a good he, point. He apparently is back in Argentina because of the international things. He had to get some special um, um, permit or whatever. To yeah. Work because of Val and Franco or whatever, but it's coming and, and, and I expect that he will be part of the group. But um, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, you know, um, <laughs> I was going to say that, you know, Adam Jean, he, he perfected a very radical style of offense, which is called park the bus. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, but anyway, beyond that, um, no, I think the goals, you know, Moreno, Marcelino Moreno is going to score goals. Yeah, he's um, Barco is going to score goals. Um, Jurgen Dam is going to score goals. Um, Sosa looks like he's going to score goals. Um, you know, again, not tons, but you know, under De Boer, it was going to be Martinez or nobody. Yeah. This team is going to score goals in a much more even way. Um, you're going to get, you know, three goals from Balo, and you're going to get three goals from Brooks Lennon, and you're going to get you, – It's you're going to see it's going to be a much more balanced offense. I hope you're right. I hope you're right. And I think, yeah, I think that will be reliant on, obviously, with any team st- remaining healthy so that every other player – is able to perform better due to their teammate. Um, what do you think about the upcoming um, – do you want to go to the Orlando game that's coming up this weekend? Uh, do you want to talk more about the CCL performance against Costa Rica or what our potential matchup is against either Philadelphia or uh, – was it Saparese? What's the name of the Costa Rican side? Saprisa. Saprisa, yeah. Um, is Philadelphia – they're playing right now, aren't they? That game's underway right now. That game's underway right now, yeah. I don't know what the result. So, um, what do you think our odds are of winning, regardless who wins wins that leg? Um, we should we should win, right? Well, look, you know, anytime you have a brand-new coach and so many new players um, who are integral to the side, it takes a, it's going to take a little bit of time to bet in. And so, um, to be honest, based on all of that – I expected us to lose this tie 
And maybe part of why I feel so happy about what we did is um, my expectations were really low. And that is not because I don't like the side. It's not because I don't. Um, very few people in CONCACAF Champions League went on the road. I expected us to, to lose in the first game, certainly when we went down a man. Uh, the, the tactical change that Heinze made in the first game after we went down a man, um, you know, if you're Heinze and you're just trying to get the team to play, you don't expect them to have any answer if you lose your goalkeeper and you go down a man, right? And yet, didn't bat an eye right and they they got it done right and you know um you know tactically even in the second game right you know again i thought we were very creative even though in the final third we didn't quite make it happen we had so many things that looked like they were about to just happen and um you know but in the second half he realized that you know we don't need another defensive midfielder he made a change and it was you know, obviously Jurgen Dam scores the goal, right? So that's a good tactical move. But um, well, to be I fair, just, to be fair, Barker scored that goal. He just got out of the way of being able to shoot it himself, so I, that Dom I could poach it. that, which he did. There were some people criticizing Barco. They were like, "What was he doing, trying to dribble around, whatever?" I'm like, he was getting to that ball. Yeah, he was 100, 110% getting that ball. And, in fact, Dom almost botched it by getting in his way and uh, and ended up scoring, thank goodness. But, uh, yeah. But, you know, and to his credit, right, he didn't try to do something crazy and run Dam off the ball. He said, all right. Yeah. yeah. And he, and he finished it. Um, so I thought the tactical – um, fluidity, the ability to adjust, looking at the game, using the players, putting them in spots. And I thought, you know, the way that we had people marked up in the back and the movement that we had had up front, we have not seen even remotely since Tata. Period. All right. So as suspected, you've helped change my negativity around what I, what I saw. Um, Because I, 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 I'm hard pressed to disagree with with your analysis. I just love when, 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 when the other team wins the ball and they play a ball. You know, in the camera, you can't see what's going on off off the ball yeah. a little bit, which is why I love watching it live, folks out there, dear podcast listener, go to the games because you can see off off the camera. But anyway, when the camera swings, you know, and the ball's being played forward, and you don't know what's happening. So many times last year right? There was a guy who had time to t take it and turn. And if you watch the two legs, every time the camera moved to that ball, right, there was someone right on his back. And that brings joy to my heart because that means we are actually going to attack people defensively, which is a, if you look at the best teams in the world, if you look at Manchester City under Guardiola, if you look at Liverpool under Klopp, if you look at you know, any of those teams, they attack people defensively. Right? Yeah, they do. Um, so what um, what do you want to see against the Orlando side? Uh, what, is that game this Saturday or Sunday? Uh, I believe it's Saturday. Okay. Um, yeah, what, what, uh, who do you think the starting lineup will be? Um. Obviously, Guzan comes back. Um, I mean, I think the big question will be uh, whether or not uh, Alan Franco, the new center back, starts or not. Yeah. Um, what, uh, I know he wasn't eligible for the last CCL game. We, I guess we don't know if he's going to yeah. be eligible for the, the first MLS. Um, yeah, you know. It's Saturday at three o'clock, by the way, dear podcast oh, listener. Saturday at three o'clock. Uh, is that in Orlando or at, in Orlando? What uh, What are the odds we're going to get to uh, a game here soon, Dave? Well, it depends on the lottery. How, yeah, how does this all work? Because you and I haven't been able to, to catch up on this as season ticket holders um, that are very anxious to have an opportunity to, to see the team live again, uh, particularly now that I've got uh, two of the Pfizer shots in my arm. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm three days clear of the, 
the second shot. So super stoked. Dear podcast listener, you are talking to two vaccinated podcasters. Yeah. So feel free to drop by the podcast um, and no fear of COVID here. <laughs> yeah, I was I was definitely bummed that the, the J&J one uh, has, has hit a little bit of a, a hiccup. And I think they were talking about maybe trying to delay the Moderna and the Pfizer one um, a couple weeks. I should ago. mention, we are still being very, very safe um, per the CDC guidelines. Mikey Dobbs only received his second vaccine more recently. And so we're waiting for the requisite time before we reunite back in front of the fire. Um, this microphone, which, this microphone is- which we could still make six feet apart. So we can <laughs> yeah. still be under CDC guidelines, even uh, even with the shot in the arm. So definitely excited to have you back here by the actual fire. And uh, and uh, I don't think you've seen the new setup here. I've got the roadcaster, um, which I still haven't figured out completely for, for good audio, but it's it's certainly bright and exciting and uh, it's, it's fun to nerd out on. Yeah, yeah certainly. What are you drinking? Uh, I'm just drinking uh, uh, Cabernet McManus um, little vino. How about yourself? That, that's your go-to right there. Yeah, it is. It's, it's the, the house Miomai one. The Miomi and the McManus. Those Ex- are your go-to. Yeah, right? Miomi's are, are uh, you know, that's our fancy wine when we want to wanna have a, have a mm-hmm. nice dinner or something. Um, I am drinking 14 Hands, which is a, a uh, Washington Ooh, yeah. State winery. Okay. I'm drinking a Cabernet from them. It's uh, lovely. That's an excellent wine. Um, and I should mention that um, as we move into the fall, um, we will also be cracking open a bottle of our own Emerald Hill Winery um, first ever vintage. That's exciting. Um, we're going to have to have a special label ATL and fire, fire version of that, though. Yes, I think that we should do that. <laughs> um, definitely do that. So going back to your question, um, as far as tickets, yeah. um, there's a lottery. So there's 50% capacity, and there's a lottery for whether you're 50%. And I think my, my vague recollection is that we would hear something by the 17th, which is three days from now. So, um, so that's roughly, what, 25,000 people that are enabled to go then from the lottery? It's not clear to me what the 50% of what, whether it's 50% of the the, the small capacity or 50% of the absolute huge capacity. I, I'm not sure, but okay. um, it's a lottery for your section. So I think a computer is going to pick a ticket and it's going to start going. Um, if any one of our seats gets picked, I think we all get to go. Um, and then as soon as it finishes the 50% from that section, then it's done. Nice. So when do we when do we know? I think it's supposed to be. I vaguely remember the seventeenth as a date. Okay. All right. Keep me. It makes sense because it's the that's the, the the Orlando game on Saturday, and then the following it's a week away from our home game. Awesome. Um. Yeah. So, how many home games do we have this year? Um, it's the same as normal, right? Yeah, I don't know. Um, need to get back though. Need to get back. I'm jonesing. Uh, yeah, um, you know, I hope, dear podcast listener, that everybody has been safe out there, and I hope that you are as excited and fired up to get back as we are. Um, the side, I think is vastly improved. All right, well, well Dave. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a toast to Darren Eels and, and to Boca Negra. Yeah, um, they, they definitely have made some good decisions. Could, yeah, I, I think, didn't think they could do it that quickly at all. Yeah, regardless of my um, cautious uh, optimism, which I, I like to be about the team, I do think, yeah, the, the pieces are there. Um, maybe, uh, you know, I get really heated when I watch a game like I saw the other night, just based on the result. So I need to come back down a little bit, just level out a little bit and give it a little bit of time. But I could see this still being a 2017 type of season where we do well, maybe make it to the playoffs, 
and next year is the real year where we maybe make it back to the cup. I was going to say the better comparison is the inaugural season, maybe. Yeah, that was, isn't that 2017? Uh, 2017, right, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. So, so, yeah, so I could see it going on a similar, uh, yeah, no, a similar cycle of 2017 being uh, reminiscent, uh, or this, this year being reminiscent of that year, and then 2022 being the year we bring it back to uh, a, a parade again. Keep in mind, we lost the first game that year. Yeah. We were there at uh, Bobby Dodd. And, and obviously, yeah, back to Darren Eels in Boca Negra, you know, it's interesting to see how well they've done with trying to navigate uh, the rules of MLS and um, the three designated players. And then I guess like the three junior, I don't know what they've been calling them, hatchlings. And I don't know all the, the rules behind that, but it seems like the, they've been really smart about managing the, you know, the, the way that they're spending money and bringing in young talent to, um, to really uh, make us competitive again. So we'll see. Yeah. And the contracts that they had put together for some of those, you know, sort of got to put warm bodies on the field last year, obviously we're not handcuffing us enough. The Adam Johns and the Kubo Torres is and right. whatever. Um, didn't handcuff us so much that, um, there was a problem and then you know and they had a lot of guts you know no problem uh, departing and, and you know cashing in on pd no problem with moving on from mesa who i was underwhelmed by deboer uh, i actually liked mesa but um i think i think he was um didn't shine due to the talent around him yeah remedies got moved on escobar got moved on yeah, LGP, LGP, Nagby, um, Nagby. I think I don't think we moved on from Nagby. Nagby moved on from us, but yeah, that's uh, fair. Um, yeah, I think that the um, you know, um, I'm really looking forward to this Alan Franco guy. Um, if he is for real then him and Miles Robinson as the center pairing is going to be just sensational. Cool. Well, that's an exciting uh, way to kind of end this podcast. Is there anything else you want to touch on before we uh, close it out? No. Um, we know uh, a little bit about uh, Atlanta United. <laughs> or a lot <laughs> about Atlanta United. We know a little bit about MLS. Um, but we're going to talk about it all. We did talk about it all tonight. Thanks, Dave. And uh, next time, hopefully you can be here by the mic and uh, we will talk about hopefully some MLS action starting this weekend. So everybody tune in to the Orlando game and we will talk about it all after that. So thanks everybody. Look forward to it. Cheers. <laughs>